are proud to present the second seminar series with a panel discussion on the new Federal Democracy Charter. I hope you will enjoy the speakers and have a lot of questions at the discussion session afterward. And once again, thank you very much for the active participation and I hope this seminar series will be beneficial for all the audience and also will be beneficial for the students from the IHRDG as well. <clears throat> Moving on to the next agenda, I would like to introduce the invited panelists for this seminar series. Firstly, the first speaker is Mr. Marcus Brand. Marcus Brand is the country director of International IDEA Myanmar and has over 20 years of experience in promoting constitutional reform and democratic governance in post-conflict contexts. He has a background in law and international relations and has worked tirelessly to support Myanmar's Democratic Alliance since the February 2021 coup. Moving on to the speaker two, Ms. Sherry Sonda. Sherry Sonda is a lawyer pro professor emeritus at the University of Melbourne, a convener of the Constitution Transformation Network, and a founding writer of the Center for Co Comparative Constitutional Studies. She has been president of both the International Association of Constitutional Law and the International Association of Centers for Federal Studies, and is a former deputy chair of the advisory board of International IDEA. She is a scholar and practitioner of comparative, in, comparative con constitutional law. In 2022, she was awarded the 10th prize for the rule of law, with particular reference to her contribution in the Asian Pacific region. The next invited guest speaker is Mr. Sujit Chaudhry. Sujit Chaudhry is an international, internationally recognized on comparative constitutional law and the author of over 100 articles, book chapters, working papers, and reports. He is also a leading authority on the Canadian Constitution and has been cited by the Supreme Court of both Canada and New Zealand. He has been an advisor to the constitutional reform and peace processes around the world for more than 20 years. And is also a senior advisor to the Foreign of Federations as well as to the International Institute for Integrated Transitions. Finally, we have Saya Amy who is an experienced researcher and peace educator and currently at the faculty member of Spring University Myanmar and IHRDG. Saya Amy is a frequent contributor to Asia Democracy Chronicles and has worked with numerous international NGOs in Myanmar as a consultant and training expert in the fields of peace building, human rights, inclusion, and federalism. Yes, um, those uh, for are the invited panelists for today's discussion. And I, I once again thank every panelist for your time and your contribution for participating in this <coughs> seminar. Moving on to the third agenda, I would like to invite speaker one, Mr. Marcus Brand, to share his uh, perspective on the Myanmar Federal Democracy Charter and discussion on the um, overview of the uh, Federal Democracy Charter. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to also take this opportunity to thank the Spring University and in particular this institute for the good collaboration that we have uh, started a few months ago. Uh, I believe that this is a very innovative approach uh, and uh, a very useful uh, vehicle and a very, very useful platform to share with different audiences and uh, I am particularly grateful and glad that we have for this uh, initial event uh, two uh, such renowned uh, international uh, constitutional scholars as uh, Cheryl and Sujit. I feel uh, uh, humbled by you know being able to speak uh, ahead of them so thank you very much for this opportunity and I uh, have always, uh, in many, many conversations, learned a lot from you. And I hope uh, you will also help us uh, uh, to make sense uh, of this uh, situation a bit more uh, as we have been trying to uh, 
to figure things out uh, ourselves. Uh, we find ourselves in a quite special and unusual, unprecedented situation in Myanmar that raises actually many, many questions. Uh, and that's why I deliberately use the word sense-making, because uh, this is in many ways uncharted territory where uh, conventional explanatory frameworks don't really fit very well and don't really apply very much. So we are still in the process of history being written <clears throat> uh, and the outcome of this process that we are not just describing but also supporting is far from certain. Uh, and I just wanted to also mention at the outset that uh, <clears throat> I will not speak about the actual situation on the ground in Myanmar, but I, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, that we are, of course, aware how extremely difficult it is for so many people inside the country right now, how much suffering has been caused uh, in the in the past one and a half years, and how many people uh, have uh, really uh, sort of uh, struggled on a daily basis to survive and to 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 provide safety to their uh, to their families and. Uh, uh, to themselves and many also are taking huge uh, sacrifices to uh, uh, stand against this military takeover and to try and work towards a Myanmar that uh, that would actually provide uh, real access to all those rights and principles that are being laid out in the federal democracy charter that we will be talking about. So my contribution today is to in a way you know, this frame the discussion and to, to describe a bit the lay of the land uh, and to remind ourselves of, of how we got here. And uh, then uh, Cheryl and Sujit will, will jump into more specific uh, questions. Uh, I would also like to remind that we have, of, as international idea, uh, we have, of course, been not only following this situation very closely, um, since the coup, but we have also taken a very strong public stand against the military coup. And we have uh, spoken publicly against the unconstitutionality of the coup. And I, I always start with a brief reminder of the unconstitutionality of the coup, because this is something that is still a little bit... Uh, counterintuitive to even have to point out because by definition coups are unconstitutional but it is of course uh, important to understand that in the military's own narrative uh, they are following the provisions of the 2008 constitution which of course can be proven to be uh, false uh, and uh, also needs to be pointed out because there is a danger that uh, simply by normalizing the the new uh, status quo in Nepita, one would fall into accepting this narrative of uh, this being actually, in fact, the application of the uh, 2008 Constitution's uh, state of emergency provisions. Uh, this was, of course, not the case simply because of the way in which the state of emergency was uh, called, uh, whereby it was necessary for the military to arrest the president and put in another acting president in order to uh, be able to declare this state of emergency. But that, as has been shown uh, many times, also by other organizations, was unconstitutional. And what is important is that this unconstitutionality has not been repaired afterwards. So all the acts taken by the military after their usurpation, usurpation of power uh, remain without a constitutional legal basis and are therefore uh, illegal and invalid. This is also important to point out in the context of, uh, let's say, when I have discussions in other countries in, in the Asia Pacific region, sometimes the question comes up, but cannot sometimes coups become legitimate after the fact, especially when the, the new regimes that result from a coup are able to normalize the situation and are able to uh, provide services and gain some outcome legitimacy, even though their process legitimacy might, uh, might be faulty. And that has certainly been the case in different historical contexts around the world. 
But that is also clearly not the case in Myanmar at the moment, where the, where the Myanmar military has not been able to gain legitimacy after the fact, uh, but has in fact met with uh, very determined uh, opposition and uh, protests by an unprecedentedly large number of people uh, opposing this very quest uh, uh, to, of power. So we can say that the coup was unconstitutional to begin with. This has not been legally or politically repaired. And therefore, the military regime in Nepito remains <clears throat> unconstitutional and unlawful and has not been able to, uh, let's say, create a new legal order. And this is also because the military has over time lost uh, increasing areas uh, in terms of effective control. Uh, so if one could say that even though it may be brutal and uh, illegitimate, but if the military was actually in physical control over uh, most of the territory, then one could say, well, that is just the new reality one has to accept. But that has been increasingly not the case. Uh, and a recent report by the Special Advisory Council on Myanmar showed that the military actually can claim only something around 17% of the territory in terms of full access and control. So this is the situation we have, let's say, on the military side. Uh, and it is also interesting to remind ourselves that this is different from the situation, let's say, prior to 2010, uh, before the 2008 constitution came into power, because now we do have an elected parliament that uh, remains in place simply because the elected members of parliament that were duly and regularly elected have convened and have taken up their mandate, both at the union level and in most cases also at the state and region level, and uh, have simply asserted their uh, uh, mandate given by the electorate. Uh, and what was, of course, interesting uh, with the initial convening of that elected parliament a few days after the coup was that the CRPH initially asked for the restoration of, con of the constitutional order of the, of the 2008 constitution. So what was interesting is that the 2008 constitution that was, of course, originally introduced by the military as a as a tool for itself to remain in in a privileged position in the state um, became a shield for the democratically elected parliament against the coup makers and basically became the tripwire over which the military itself uh, stumbled and uh, and lost its uh, legitimate role as a state institution and this initial, let's say, ins insistence on the validity of the 2008 constitution changed in the course of the month of February. And then in the early March, when the initial version of the Federal Democracy Charter was adopted by the parliament together with the other resistance forces, uh, that had switched to uh, uh, basically uh, the recognition that the 2008 constitution by the violation, as a result of the violation from the military, had lost its legitimacy as a whole. And there is some interesting discussions one can have about how constitutions die and lose their legitimacy. And I think there is some really interesting literature that one could apply to this particular case. But let me jump to the conclusion that we basically agree with the um, uh, representatives of the demo various democratic institutions that the 2008 constitution at this point uh, has lost its legitimacy and is no longer the legal framework to return to uh, and to be applied. But there are some interesting questions here about whether this means that we, we find ourselves in a complete constitutional and legal vacuum and to what extent one can assume some sort of a continuity from the previous constitutional legal order. 
both in terms of regular statutory laws, but also in terms of um, certain constitutional aspects and features, such as the existence of uh, states and regions bound and, and their names and boundaries, or the state flag and, and, and name and things like that, that were obviously uh, enshrined in the 2008 constitution, but that still continue to be applied de facto, even by the NUG and the CRPH. Um, so now let me jump ahead. I already mentioned in from sort of uh, a few weeks after the coup, we had this federal democracy charter in place initially uh, with its two parts that had slightly different drafting histories. Uh, but essentially what it created was the platform that we now know as the National Unity Consultative Council, the NUCC. And it is that uh, body that has continued to work on the Federal Democracy Charter that eventually led to the adoption by the People's Assembly in January this year uh, of a revised version of the FTC uh, that we now have in front of us. It still has two parts and it uh, includes a number of uh, principles uh, and a vision statement for, for the new country that is supposed to result from this process. Uh, but it also includes a number of what one could call interim institutional constitutional arrangements and gives uh, a framework for the functioning of the NUG, the CRPH and the NUCC and the relationships between them. But let me now jump ahead to one of the questions that came up uh, already in the, the chat here, namely, can we consider the FTC an interim constitution? And here we would say <coughs> that this is, first of all, the FTC itself does not claim to be an interim constitution. And I also think it would be uh, wrong to consider it that. I would uh, rather say that it is a political uh, framework agreement with some interim constitutional uh, aspects, but it, it should not necessarily be taken liter literally as a legal constitutional text. And it is also not in that sense enforceable by any court of law or any institutional arrangement. So what is actually written into the uh, FTC as a, as a, let's say, ultimate, uh, uh, ultimate uh, answer to all kinds of uh, disputes is that all questions go back to the plenary of the People's Assembly uh, to be resolved uh, through political consensus. Uh, so there is no such thing as a constitutional court or a Supreme Court that one could go to with a constitutional question about the FTC. Ultimately, all these questions come back to the NUCC itself to be resolved by consensus in the plenary of all the participating uh, organizations. And that brings us to one of the uh, let's say maybe uh, most uh, most uh, important questions about the whole setup, which is that it is not entirely clear who the constituents are of this new uh, interim constitutional framework. First of all, it is not clear who the constituent units are that form the new federation, and second, it is also not clear who exactly the members are of the various uh, bodies. Well, it's clear in the case of the CRPH and the NUG, but it is not clear in the case of the NUCC and the People's Assembly. And what kind of, uh, the, what the nature of the relationship these participating entities have with the uh, institution in the sense that do they represent organizations and or groups of organizations or are they participating in their own personal capacity uh, and in that case uh, who they might be accountable to so there are still lots of questions about about sort of from a constitutional perspective about the FTC but there are but I would like to emphasize uh, the things that are clear from it uh, and that is uh, that uh, the FTC clearly agrees on, uh, on a number of basic principles for the new 
state that is to, to emerge from this ongoing constitution building process. And one is that, as I already mentioned, it would be a very decentralized federal system whereby sovereignty uh, rests originally with constituent units and the people living there. So it is also specifically not designed as an ethnic federal uh, system, uh, but uh, based on constituent units that are, however, not defined. Uh, second is that uh, there is a very strong democratic principle uh, in the sense that uh, all security uh, organizations and institutions would be subordinate to, to civilian rule and oversight. So there is an end to any kind of special status for the military that was such a strong feature of the 2008 constitution. And then thirdly, uh, there is a whole range of, uh, of provisions on principles for uh, uh, human rights, non-discrimination, equality, secularism, women's empowerment, etc., that are quite uh, numerous in the FTC, but at this point they are not yet defined as enforceable legal rights, but more in, in, the, in the form of uh, sort of statements of intention, uh, but there is not, not really any uh, accessible um, um, institutional framework through which any individual could actually uh, have these rights uh, guaranteed in, a, in some kind of court of law. So we are, and, and the last uh, thing uh, I want to say is that the FTC, of course, lays out the process uh, towards a new permanent constitutional framework. And the next step here is that a transitional constitution should be uh, adopted by the People's Assembly, even though the timetable is not entirely clear, and also the the way in the, of, uh, let's say, structuring the consultations and the decision-making process is also uh, somewhat uh, ambiguous. Uh, the main role uh, is given to the NUCC, uh, but it is unclear how the NUCC should uh, um, actually conduct these uh, negotiations and therefore the uh, NUG uh, has also taken a, a role of uh, facilitating uh, some of these discussions and a number of groups and uh, committees have been set up both within the NUCC framework but also in the NUG and this work is currently going on. There are still lots of questions about the next steps also uh, with regard to the federal units themselves of whether there should be or could be uh, state level constitutions and to what extent they would uh, predate any kind of transitional constitutional arrangement. Uh, and uh, also then what kind of event would trigger uh, the transitional constitution to come into effect uh, and to be, uh, uh, to be implemented because it is only after the transition phase begins that the actual constitution making process should start in the form of a constituent assembly that has also yet to be put together uh, and uh, then some form of participatory and inclusive uh, constitution building process should commence that would ultimately uh, result in the adoption of a new federal constitution and then constitutionalism should somehow be um, be uh, installed. Let me finish here. Uh, there are lots of other issues that one could say about this, but I think it suffices like this uh, as, a, as a general uh, frame and layout for where we are in this process and in this discussion. Uh, and I hope uh, that I didn't uh, spread more confusion and uh, cause more, more uh, uh, so let's say open questions than I than I have answered. Back to you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Sheree Sondos to give presentation on interior and constitutions. Thank you very much. Um, can I begin uh, also by uh, can I begin also by um, thanking the organizers for. Uh, for their invitation to speak tonight and to say how what a pleasure it is to be on the same platform uh, as Marcus and Sujit, and to thank Marcus for um, uh, 
by his excellent grounding uh, of what we're talking about tonight. Now, I had hoped to be sharing my own screen so that I could move the slides myself, but uh, as I, that's not possible. Can you give me the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so this is what I've been asked to do tonight. Um, I've been asked to present, first of all, a comparative overview of interim constitutional arrangements. So that's my responsibility tonight. And how such interim arrangements might be expanded into a long-term federal constitution suitable for multi-ethnic societies. So that's a big, a big brief, uh, and I can only focus on bits of it. Uh, so let me just say that in the time available, uh, I'm going to focus largely on the interim constitutional arrangements part of this, and I'll describe those as interim constitutions, although, in fact, a wide range of different terms might be used to describe the same phenomenon. Um, there have been around 30 of these interim constitutions or interim constitutional arrangements uh, over the past three decades or so. Uh, and I've given you a link there to the IDEA policy paper, uh, which is a very good paper on interim constitutions, and I uh, recommend it to you if you want to follow any of these issues up. In the course of the presentation, I'm going to refer to three examples of countries that are multi-ethnic, and that had a form of federation as the final goal, uh, but would use the technique of an interim constitution. And the three I will refer to from time to time are South Africa, Nepal, and Somalia. Uh, but there are others that would meet these criteria as well. Uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia are examples. Next slide, please. So let me begin by saying a little bit about interim constitutions themselves. Uh, I've given you a very broad definition here. An interim constitution is an instrument that operates as a constitution, and of course constitutions do lots of different things as well, uh, for a period of time while a more lasting constitution is made and put into effect. Now that period of time can be short, two years say, uh, or in some cases much longer, and depending what happens over that period between the making of an interim constitution and a longer term constitution coming into effect, um, that intermediate period may also be divided into phases. For example, if there are problems of legitimacy during that phase and an election is held, and it's a credible election, that may change the character uh, of the period even under the interim constitution. And we can see that at work uh, in the South African case, for example. An interim constitution isn't always used when a new constitution is being drawn up. It's particularly useful where there is no current constitution at all, arguably in the case of Libya, for example, or more usually in which the current constitution is discredited or otherwise unworkable. Uh, and Marcus talked about that in the context of Myanmar. So in that sense, an interim constitution really operates as a bridge between a constitution-free uh, situation and a more final constitutional settlement. Uh, and you can compare the situation in uh, countries of that kind with the countries where there's a, an acceptable constitution in place, but they decide that they want to draw up a new constitution. Uh, and in that situation, you don't have an interim constitution necessarily, uh, the existing government remains in place while the new constitution is made. And we've recently seen uh, this being uh, done in, in, in Chile, for example. Um, we see in the literature that interim constitutions are often used in the context of post-conflict constitution making. Uh, and that is the case because very often either the conflict itself or the process of resolving the conflict has made the existing constitution unusable uh, for whatever reason, uh, meaning that an interim constitution is a useful device. And on these, in these sorts of cases, there may be, but there won't always be, but there may be a relationship between the peace settlement and the interim constitution. For example, uh, the interim constitution is likely to incorporate elements uh, of the peace. Next slide. 
Now, the three cases I said we might think about a bit from time to time, and let me just briefly mention them. South Africa uh, had an interim constitution in 2003, which bridged its move from apartheid uh, to constitutional democracy. Uh, and then a new and more lasting constitution in 19, uh, sorry, must be 1993, sorry, a new and more lasting constitution in um, uh, 1997 provided for a form of federation. Sorry for that mix up with the dates. Second case, Nepal, uh, there was an interim constitution in 2007, which followed a comprehensive peace agreement uh, which in turn was a settlement of violent and protracted conflict. Um, the interim constitution came into effect in 2007. The more lasting federal constitution did not come into effect until 2015 after some um, quite difficult procedural problems. Uh, and even now in Nepal, there are some quite significant problems of implementing the new federal constitution. And then the last case, Somalia, a transitional federal charter was introduced in 2004 as part of a transition from conflict, internal conflict and state failure. Uh, and then another provisional constitution was adopted in 2012. There are reasons why that's described as provisional, but the interesting point for our purposes, I think, is to see that you can sometimes build two interim se settlements on each other. Uh, as has occurred in the case of Somalia. Uh, mind you that in Somalia, they still do not have a final uh, federal constitutional settlement. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so something about making interim constitutions, uh, you, can, you can tell from what I've said already that very often interim constitutions are made in extremely difficult circumstances. You're emerging from conflict, there's no acceptable constitution in existence. There's some urgency around putting a constitutional settlement of some kind in place. And as a result, an interim constitution is typically made by a process that wouldn't normally be regarded as sufficiently legitimate for a final constitution. Legitimate in terms of the institutional arrangements you have, no constitutional or constituent assembly, for example, legitimate in terms of public engagement in the constitution making process. So accepting the difficulties of the situation in which interim constitutions are made, nevertheless, uh, it's useful for the process of making such a constitution to be as careful and as inclusive as the circumstances allow. And that's because interim constitutions are significant in a whole range of ways. Uh, many, constitution, many provisions in an interim constitution will in fact be carried through into the final constitution, and that's not a bad thing. You don't want to be chopping and changing your constitutional arrangements unnecessarily, so there is a certain amount of carry through. And even when there's not carry through, uh, you can use interim constitutions in an experimental way, uh, but if you're going to do that, you need to learn from whatever, in the interim constitution so that you can build on that in the final constitution. Uh, other advantages of an interim constitution, success um, in making the final constitution may depend on whatever the interim constitution says about the final constitution making process. And in addition, an interim constitution can help transition to a new constitutional culture which in the end, the final constitution uh, will depend on. Next slide, please. So um, you can probably glean from what I've said already what some of the functions of an interim constitution might be. Now, again, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot, many aspects of an interim constitution will depend significantly on context. Of course, you can put in an interim constitution whatever you want to put in it. Um, but typically, uh, an interim constitution will do the following things, and these follow from its task of being a bridge between a less legitimate constitutional order and a new legitimate constitutional order. So usually an interim constitution will do, firstly, provide a framework of institutions, principles and practices 
for an interim constitutional government. So we're assuming that there's no valid constitution or no effective constitution and therefore no effective government. So an interim constitution can provide the framework for a government that will, can govern the country while the final constitution is being made. Because of the nature of that government, very often these arrangements involve power sharing. Uh, usually they will provide mechanisms to protect and enforce the constitution through typically judicial review, and Marcus referred to that. Um, and the uh, arrangements, again, may vary over the period of operation of the interim institutions. So that's the first thing that you would expect an interim constitution to do, provide an interim constitutional framework for a, an immediate government. Secondly, and very importantly, an interim constitution is likely to provide a roadmap for a more final constitution. And those, that roadmap might do a couple of things. First of all, it should map out the constitution-making process. How is this new final constitution going to be made? Over what period of time? Uh, but very often as well, the interim constitution will say something about the substance of the final constitution. There will be a basis of agreement um, uh, about, uh, sorry, I'm being warned about time, uh, about um, uh, on what the final constitution should deal with, principles of some kind. Uh, then there may be uh, likely to be procedures for changing uh, the, the interim constitution and um, um, uh, other arrangements that may be agreed. Uh, now, can I go on to the next slide, please? I know I'm running out. I'm going to, if time, I'm just going to take you quickly over these. These slides are intended to say what is the link uh, between an interim constitutions and federalism. Uh, if the uh, final constitution is intended to be federal, uh, what um, might the interim constitution say about that? So most obviously, the interim constitution uh, is likely to prescribe that the final constitution should be not only federal, but perhaps a particular type of federal constitution. Next slide, please. Um, and the point of using an, uh, an interim constitution to set up uh, the federation is that it can assist the move uh, to, uh, the, to it can assist the final transition to a federal constitution. And the point being made on this slide, and I won't dwell on it now, is to say one of the most difficult sorts of new constitutional arrangements to properly implement and bed down are federal arrangements. And any assistance you can get from a foundation in the interim constitution to assist the transition from some illegitimate regime to a working federal constitution that works in the benefits for benefit people uh, is advantageous and an interim constitution should be designed with that in mind and uh, there is one final slide but I won't uh, dwell on it now. So I'm going to speak a bit about um, the federal democracy charter and security sector reform issues and of course those are uh, top of mind uh, in Myanmar uh, because um, in, in because the, there has been a military coup uh, by um, that has led to the creation of a junta, and uh, and so an an issue that existed under the previous civilian regime and which exists uh, and which will be a priority under um, a new civilian regime will be um, the the governance of the security sector, which which will entail its reform. And so what I thought what I put up on the screen um, is uh, an extract from part one. Uh, the Federal Democracy Charter that, that I just would like to walk through. Um, and then I'd like to look at part two um, before showing a few slides. Uh, and the reason I've done this is just to orient ourselves a bit to some of the specific goals um, that are set out in the FDC uh, and also uh, regarding um, the the interim arrangements, as both uh, Marcus and Cheryl have referred to in the FDC regarding some of these issues. So, so what are the interim? Uh, what are the goals? And so the and so what's what's quite striking uh, about the FDC uh, is that there are um, 
one, two, three, four, five, six uh, provisions that speak to the issue of uh, the security sector, and they all do slightly different things. Uh, Clause 55 or Article 55 um, says that the security and defense policies of the federal union are to be based on human security. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a short form uh, for, for capturing the idea that the point of uh, the ultimate goal of security sector institutions is to protect human life uh, and to uh, to provide either through policing, um, so through internal activity or ex or protecting from external threats, but the goal of that activity is to protect human life. Uh, and then the second sentence, which is even it, which is also equally important is the foundational principles that all troops of the federal unions security and defense are under the administration of a democratically elected civilian government. And so this is the this is the um, this is a fundamental commitment in the document to uh, civilian control of the military. Uh, and it um, and it implies, of course, that the military itself is not does not administer uh, or does not make ultimate um, administrative decisions. What this leaves unspecified, of course, is uh, in what respects the military uh, can engage in some degree of self administration, and in what respects the a civilian government can administer the military without. Um, being allowed to micromanage it or go so far as to be able to abuse it uh, for its own uh, ends. Um, then the second um, clause 56 speaks to the role of parliaments. Um, and it says that the parliament shall enact the security and defense policies uh, of the federal union. And it also says that the security and defense budget shall be reviewed and approved by parliament. So, so this, provision is a provision regarding the separation of powers between the federal parliament and the federal executive. And, and what it says here is, is, is that the federal parliament, that is not the federal executive, shall enact security and defense policies of the federal union. And, and, and relatedly, the parliament and not the executive shall, shall review and, and approve budgets. And so, so there's a this, the principle that that comes out in Article 56 uh, is is the is the, is is that um, within civilian government, um, it's the parliament that sets uh, defense policy and budgets as opposed to the executive. And so that's um, another important principle uh, in this document. Now, the, the, Article 57 is the first one that speaks directly to federalism. And so here it refers to both a federal police force and a state police forces. And so the I so and it says that these forces shall be formed separately and um, independently. And so uh, what this clause contemplates is that there'll be a national or a federal police force, but also separate state police force says uh, presumably one for each state. Uh, and in addition, it the second sentence refers to forces for state security. So there seems to be um, an idea here that there might, in addition to a state police force, be a state security force. Uh, and then that raises the question of what the relationship is between the state security force and the state police force, uh, and of course, uh, between um, the state security forces and national uh, security uh, forces. Um, and here, um, there are provisions, then there are two sentences that, um, that tr define governance and oversight in relation to state police and security forces. And so the, the first sentence that I've highlighted says that these police and security forces shall be under the administration of their respective state governments. And so that, that provision, that sentence is, um, doesn't specify whether the administration should be, um, is within the power of a state parliament 
um, or a state executive. So it's 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 quite different from the provision governing the the from from governing um, federal um, security and defense institutions, which says that security and defense policies are determined by the federal parliament. Uh, but on, on with respect to budgeting, though, uh, the, Article 57 parallels Article 56 and says that the budgets of state police and security forces shall be reviewed and approved by state parliaments. So, uh, so th there's a legislative role here as well. Uh, and then um, Article 58 speaks of the issue of interjurisdictional coordination. And it says that uh, the governments of the federal union and of the states shall uh, decide in coordination to effectively use the security forces uh, in times of emergencies. Uh, and in particular, um, emergencies defined by with respect to security, uh, but also natural disasters and rescue operations. And so um, what this um, suggests, um, so what, what this clause uh, speaks to in embryonic form uh, is the idea that there, there, there shall be emergency powers um, and that in the context of uh, the exercise of emergency powers, um, it, there is a, a duty on the federal government and state governments to co effectively coordinate the use of their forces. So it's 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 a it's a positive duty to do so, which is important. And then finally, um, the of course the question that Article Fifty Eight raises is what happens outside in the you know the, the emergency context, in the non emergency context. How should a coordination take place? And that's what Article Fifty Nine speaks to, and it and and what it what it what it contemplates is the creation of a national security and defense council of the federal union uh, and um, as i'll explain in a moment uh, national security councils are a a common feature of of of, of contemporary constitutions um, that govern uh, the security sector and they provide for coordination typically speaking uh, they provide for coordination across uh, the different branches of the security sector. So between the defense, the police, and the intelligence. But in the Myanmar context, Article 59 goes a step further and provides that the National Security and Defense Council should be a mechanism for interjurisdictional coordination. Uh, and uh, and and what's also interesting, uh, and so is that. Um, at least um so th th there shall be a mem at least one member of the security councils of each state so each state would have a security council it seems um and moreover it says that the number of federal personnel shall not exceed more than 30 percent of the total council members and so this is a highly decentralized structure um uh because the federal uh federal government would only have um, would not have more than than thirty percent of the total council members. It's not clear uh, if this is a uh, a voting body or not, but but the point is to give a significant voice uh, to state level institutions and and representatives. Uh, and then Article sixty um, is is entitled the Security System of the Federal Union, and and it's worth um, looking at it in in detail, it says, it says there's a security system of the federal union. So that is the different components of, uh, or of the different security sector agencies um, are together constitute a system. And so there is, there are um, federal agencies, there are state agencies, um, there might be local level uh, agencies and and there should be um and 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 these agencies are defined by a separation of decision making powers uh in addition there shall be geographically sensitive strategies to structure how these agencies are part of the system um and security sector personnel appointments so um so issues of, of representation 
uh, and accountability uh, are are built into Article 60, and and it says that appointments should reflect customs concerns and the needs of local people. Um, and then um, other points that I would want to highlight here from Article 60 are the idea of human security. Again, that is the the point of a of a of a of a of security sector agencies is to maintain human security. Um, it's also to maintain the safety of the community and defense of the union. So external defense is is, re is referenced here. These organizations must be inclusive, and and that is um, is implicit in much of the previous articles, which refer to state level security sector agencies, which are, of course are meant to counteract um, a history where national security sector agencies have not been inclusive or representative. They have principally represented or, or been staffed by the Boer majority. Uh, and then and then finally, forces and services with the participation of various ethnic groups. So this could not be more explicit uh, that the um, ethnic resistance organizations um, um, are meant to, um, and the groups they represent are meant to participate. Uh, in the security sector. So, so those are key provisions in part one. Now, what I'd like to turn to um, are, is part two. So as uh, Marcus has uh, indicated in his comments, um, the, the FTC is not an interim constitution because it doesn't purport to be one. Uh, but nevertheless, it does uh, set out certain interim arrangements. And, and, and what's interesting is that there is a um, uh, an article, Article 27, that addresses security and defense and on an interim basis, and it has three uh, clauses that I, I want to uh, look at. Um, the first uh, is, um, oh, and I have about, oh my goodness, only a few minutes left. Well, that's time flies. So let me let let me go through each of these clauses and then we'll see how much time we have left. So, um, and so it first says that um, the interim national unity government, so the NUG, in coordination with the NUCC shall develop national level defense arrangements to defend the union. So there is already in this document, um, an, an, um, an allocation or an assignment of responsibility towards the NUG to develop national level defense arrangements. Okay, and so, and, and by referring to national level defense arrangements, this clause um, does not refer to state level uh, arrangements. Then um, clause B, uh, in Article 27 says the interim, so the NUG shall immediately develop people's protection measures to ensure that people are secure and the rule of law prevails. And so, so the reference to the rule of law is, is of fundamental importance here, because of course, as, as, as Marcus has said, um, the, the coup uh, is based on an utterly illegal and unconstitutional foundation. And so, uh, and so the NUG's counter vision and the NUCC's counter vision for a constitutional democracy in Myanmar as reflected in the Federal Democracy Charter is of a, a Myanmar based on the rule of law. So, so, the, so how the NUG um, approaches security sector and defense governance uh, in the interim phase must be based on the rule of law. And so, uh, and so it, uh, this clause doesn't define what the rule of law means specifically, but I would argue it means at, at a minimum compliance with the charter as a whole, both part two, but also part one, uh, and its commitments to um, uh, of the manner in which decision making occurs under the charter and to human rights. And those are bundled into this commitment to the rule of law, right? And then finally, and I'll, maybe I'll conclude here and, and raise a question, which is that the, uh, Clause C of Article 27 says that the NUG shall recognize the role of and coordinate with the respective EROs based uh, in the state. 
uh, when it carries out security and defense arrangements to protect the people of that state. And so the, the role of the EROs is recognized, uh, it's institutionalized uh, in this document, and, and the NUG is placed under a duty to recognize the role and to coordinate with the EROs, not to supplant them. And so, so the final question that I'd like to raise uh, before turning it back to the chair uh, is the one that Cheryl raised, which is the, the, um, as, is the transition from uh, an interim set, uh, an interim constitution to a federal set of, of constitutional arrangements. Now, th as Marcus has said, the, the FDC doesn't purport to be an interim constitution, but it is an interim set of arrangements. And so the question is, how does one get from 27C, which, which recognizes the EROs, uh, to a constitution that complies or an, inter or an interim constitution that complies with part one, which talks about state police forces and state security forces? Is it that the EROs become those forces? Um, and if so, uh, what is the way in which the ER, is there any role for the EROs to be um, participate in the federal police force or the army? Is that excluded or is that also available? Uh, and so they're, 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 they're important and interesting and, and, and I'll be frank, quite challenging questions um, regarding a, a, a security sector roadmap uh, that are raised by these documents but aren't settled by them that I hope that uh, the NUG and the NUCC, the EROs and others uh, think carefully about uh, as we as we all move forward. And th thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, wonderful to collaborate with everyone here and and particularly to see my very old friends. And I say that and not that they're old, but we're we're long standing friends, uh, Marcus and Cheryl. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Sudhir, for um, analyzing on the um, Federal Democracy Charter on part one and part two as well. And also thank you to um, Ms. Cheryl for um, explaining about the interior and constitution as well as, uh, as well as highlighting some of the a few exam cases and mentioning the function of the constitution and also the transition to um, a, a final constitution. Um, moving on to the last speaker, I would like to invite Sayah Amy to give an uh, overall um, finalization on the um, previous speakers and also your personal perspective on the uh, democracy charter of Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cousin, and very nice to meet all the amazing speakers. And give, like, thank you very much for the Institute to give me a floor. So uh, my role is very simple. Just listen to the uh, experts' opinions and expert presentations and make summarization. So uh, I will speak in both language, in English and in Burmese. So first of all, I will speak in English a little bit more. So like, like as the first speakers, Marcus actually explains about the grounds of the Federal Democracy Charters, and which is really interesting. So I also agree with you that Federal Democracy Charters has many aspects of interior and constitutional arrangements, but it has a lack of the uh, constitutional characteristics. So like that, that we, we, we the, the, there may be many debates about FTC can be used as the interior and constitutions or not. However, according to the roadmaps of the Federal Democracy Charters, one day, we don't know about, sure about the timeline, but one day we will have the transitional constitutions and transitional government. According to the roadmaps of Federal Democracy Charters, there are 12 roadmaps. So after the uh, after the transitional government, uh, before the transitional government, we will have the transitional constitutions. Then we will have a transitional government. Then we will ratify the federal democracy constitution, federal democratic constitutions. So I think that the idea of the, the idea behind the federal democracy charter is the federal democracy charters will be the foundation of these 
transitional constitutions and federal democratic constitutions. And I think that the, the, the three speakers already mentioned that they are also guiding principles. We, we can see these guiding principles in the federal democracy charters as well. So they are sent like securities related policy and policy grounds, which uh, such uh, yeah, such already mentioned. So we can definitely base the federal democracy charters to to have the transitional constitutions and and the uh, federal democratic constitutions as well. And I understand that we cannot know who are participating in the federal democracy charter specifically and UCC. I, I I actually agree with Marcus that it is like uh, it's quite difficult to uh, assess that because uh, we don't know for sure about the inclusions and inclusiveness of federal democracy charters. The thing is Myanmar. Myanmar, like according to the successive governments and successive political history, all we have is a kind of constitutional crisis. And one of the uh, problems of constitutional crisis is the inclusion problem. So uh, many people are talking and demanding about the inclusion because there is not enough inclusion in the past of Myanmar political history. So we are very concerned that how inclusion, how inclusive NAPDIS exists in the Federal Democracy Charter uh, development and federal democracy charters uh, implementation. We really concerned about that. And we understand that this is the time of emergency and security concerns are very high and it's very difficult to identify who participated in what. However, we really uh, uh, look forward that we really hope that there are many important stakeholders participating in the NUCC. So uh, in order to move to the uh, next uh, speakers, I really, uh, and we have the Federal Democracy Charters around May. Many people that talk about we need the interior constitution in order to work effectively in the context of Myanmar. Federal Democracy Charter is not enough. Many people voice out like that. And then, however, after like people assemblies, the revised versions come out and then like we have to wait for the like uh, the we have to wait for the transition of constitutions. However, I think the Federal Democracy Charters we work but there are many limitations. So I really expect that we will have the true interior constitution very soon. But however, is uh, like we, we are not sure it's possible or not because there is no uh, uh, there is no explanation or so there is no presence of interior constitution in the federal democratic charter roadmap. So we can assume that transitional uh, transitional constitution maybe even uh, interior or not. Like we we have many questions. Also, we also have many questions about that as well. And I agree with the uh, uh, switch that such that about the uh, the federal democracy charters uh, security arrangement is very decentralized and very and very happy uh, about that because uh, decentralization is important specifically for the country like my, like Myanmar. So uh, we have. That all like every state and every ethnic cities and every groups have their own capacities. I have no doubts on the capabilities and capacities. What we need is the chance and opportunities. So I believe that if we have the transitional justice based on that decentralized federal democracy charter security policy, uh, we will have like better security arrangement in the future as well. And I also have the same questions that how will be the future of the ethnic armed groups and ethnic armed resistance groups in the uh, new uh, federal democratic union. I also have the similar concerns about that as well. And I'm very, I'm uh, actually, I'm really interested about the idea of national security and defense council, specifically about the uh, a fewer a fewer spaces for the federal partners than the states. So that would be the new and interesting arrangement for the for our new country. I'm very excited about that as well. So I will speak in uh, Bamis from now on. So uh Myama Janoru Diga uh they are Myama really Myaji she may look on our young chibari. So they are ဒါလောက်တောင်းကိုရှိကတုံးဘောနော်ညာရှင်တုံးပြောသွားသလိုပဲဂျနရိုးဖက်တရီမကူဒီချာတာနဲ့ပတ်သက်ပြီးဂျ
ဒီစင်တရလိုက်ဖြစ်စေမယ်နိုင်ငံအသစ်တစ်ခုပေါ့ဘူးနာတော့ပြောတယ်ကျွန်တော်တို့ကျွန်တော်ကတော့ဖယ